Good day. I'm Dr. Wayne Jonas, and this talk is part of a series on integrative health. This one focused on the use of evidence-based approaches for integrative health. Um, basing integrative health on good science is important. Uh, in this talk, you'll learn about what is evidence, how do you find it, how do you use it uh, and analyze it, and how do you apply it in healthcare practices. I am a uh, professor of family medicine at Georgetown and the Uniformed Services University uh, and the author of um, hundreds of peer-reviewed articles. I've had the fortunate um, experience in my uh, years uh, to be able to practice both conventional family medicine, primary care, and integrative care and also to be able to do scientific research on it. As director of the Office of Alternative Medicine at the National Institutes of Health, uh, the uh, director of the Medical Research Fellowship at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, and a World Health Organization Center for Traditional Medicine Research um, while I was also at NIH. Um, I'm drawing on this experience uh, to give you um, an important uh, skills and knowledge on how to use good science-based integrative health. The objectives of this talk are uh, several fold. First, to understand what evidence is and why it is important in CIH, complementary and integrative health. Number two, to understand the primary evidence types that are available and the models for their analysis about CIH that are available in practice and how to use them. Number three, to know the primary sources of reliable evidence on CIH and how to critically evaluate that information specifically for the benefit of patients. Number four, to review some current evidence for complementary and integrative approaches specifically to chronic pain, and I'll illustrate a case on that, uh, that'll show you how to apply critical analysis of the evidence uh, for the decisions uh, with a patient in pain. First, let me ask you a question. What is the most important type of evidence that's needed for making clinical decisions? Is it randomized control trials uh, compared against placebo? Is it meta-analyses of randomized control trials compared to standard care? Is it observational studies showing the percent improvement and the adverse effect rates in actual practice? Is it studies on the biological mechanisms of a treatment or is it reports of patients' experiences uh, and preferences for a treatment? Or is it none or all of the above? As we go through uh, this talk, I hope you'll be able to answer that question for yourself. Using evidence, first of all, requires that we know what we're going to use the information for. And unfortunately, uh, there are a number of competing interests within healthcare that are attempting to give you evidence for different purposes. Number one, and most important, of course, are the patients. And they're usually seeking out what they want, which may or may not always be the best for them. Number two, there are providers, clinicians. Uh, and they're usually trying to provide the patient with what they need um, uh, based on their own training and expertise. And then finally, there is the industry. And the industry is, of course, providing increasing tools for use, uh, but their goals are not necessarily patient what benefit, what they want or what patients need, uh, but will make profit for them if they can sell the pill and procedure. Therefore, in making decisions, clinicians are in the middle of this decision-making and have to specifically ask what evidence am I being given, for whom, and for what purpose? Thus, asking the right questions is the most important first step in using good evidence-based medicine. I call this the triple aim of evidence-based medicine. We want information that is relevant to the decision that we're making with patients. We want it to be rigorous, that is, based on good science and good methods, and we want it as close to real time as possible, uh, matching the population or the person that we're treating in front of us. 
Thus, asking the right question is the first important step in doing good evidence-based complementary and integrative health. Let me illustrate this with an example from a patient. I call her Sally, and here's a brief history and the summary of her SOAP notes, that is her clinical diagnosis assessments that she had over the years. She was an executive VP with good health insurance and access to full medical care. She had a car accident uh, and then developed chronic low back pain after this. That pain persisted even after multiple treatments such as physical therapy, TENS, injections, visiting a chiropractor and taking supplements. The question when she came to me is, what is the best evidence-based treatment for somebody like Sally, who unfortunately has a problem very common in the population, chronic low back pain? Sally's so-called team over the years with her multiple soap notes and visits looked like this. She had primary care physicians, physical therapists, specialists, surgeons, behavioral medicines, chiropractors, and others. I put the word team in quotes because they weren't actually working as a team. Each one saw Sally independently and made different recommendations based on their knowledge and purportedly based on good evidence. Increasingly, um, guidelines for evidence in chronic pain with patients like Sally includes non-pharmacological approaches. Organizations such as the American College of Physicians, Food and Drug Administration, uh, the National Institutes of Health, and the Joint Commission uh, all recommend non-pharmacological approaches to chronic pain in pati patients like Sally. The VA and the DOD are now implementing many of these kinds of things across the board. Patients with chronic pain and many other chronic diseases are in fact already using these, but they often use a different term for them sometimes called complementary and alternative or integrative medicine approaches. And they include approaches such as therapeutic massage, yoga, acupuncture, spinal manipulation, and mind-body practices not common within the conventional care. Many of these now have sufficient evidence uh, to be brought into and delivered as these national recommendations uh, indicate. Putting these three areas together, standard conventional medicine, complementary and alternative medicine, and self-care or behavior change is what I define as integrative health care. Uh, this type of care, of course, has to be done within the social context, environment, and the personalization of the patient's life circumstances. This kind of merger uh, provides the best of all approaches, provided it's based on good evidence. Second question, what approach now would you recommend for Sally? Surgery, acupuncture, yoga, TENS, meditation, or a supplement such as curcumin? Let's go through and try to figure out how to use good evidence to make the best decision for Sally. To do that, we need to know how to use evidence in practice and this includes, first of all, what are the key questions that different types of evidence uh, can inform us about? Second, what types of evidence are there? Uh, there's multiple types uh, and we need to know what they are. Third, what are the best sources of evidence? Uh, the internet is full of lots of information and it isn't necessarily the best source for finding good quality science. Fourth, how do you evaluate that evidence? And we'll show you some tools for critical analysis of evidence that you can apply in any type of situation. Finally, we need to explore how does meaning and context, that is the beliefs, the expectations, the therapeutic rituals, influence the effect of that evidence-based practices. All of that then converges in making the best decisions uh, to use evidence to help a patient like Sally. Let's start with the key components. What types of evidence are there? And what are their goals? This graphic, uh, which I um, uh, often use to educate uh, students and providers about this, shows the basic types of clinical evidence and others that are used for clinical decision-making. 
It's in the gray triangle on the outside. Let's look at some of these. They include things like uh, on the side uh, of effects testing, systematic reviews, and meta-analyses, often used by regulators. Randomized control trials, often used by clinical researchers and others, and basic scientists, uh, or basic research, laboratory research, often used by basic scientists. These types of evidence are getting at different types of information. At attempting to determine whether something is proven or not, determine whether you can attribute an effect to a treatment, or understanding its underlying mechanism. On the other side of the pyramid are types of evidence that are mostly used for deciding on use. This includes health services research, often used by public health officials for making decisions practitioners who often use outcomes or epidemiological research in the general population uh, to determine well, what is the potential benefit or the likelihood of benefit. And then finally, uh, qualitative information or case reports, which are often very attractive to patients because they tell stories that explain their experience uh, in undergoing a therapy. These types of evidence get at general use, association, and meaning for patients. How would you analyze all these different types of information in order to make the appropriate decision for a patient like Sally? Let me illustrate to you three different approaches that are often used and that you'll see out in the literature uh, and that you also can use. One of those is the evidence hierarchy model. What this model does is it takes the evidence types that I've just shown you uh, and it places them in a hierarchy. It puts systematic reviews and meta-analysis at the top and then subsequently goes down with randomized studies and laboratory research, non-randomized, and finally at the bottom, case reports, surveys, and qualitative research. It values the top of the pyramid over the bottom of the pyramid in terms of deciding what's valid for making clinical decisions. One of the uh, top groups that does this and provides very valuable information using this strategy is the Cochrane Collaboration. It relies largely on meta-analyses that graph out the effect size on multiple randomized control trials that are critically evaluated uh, and then provides that information on its website uh, and to providers. It seeks out the information that is quantitative, that can be measured using numbers, that is attributional, that is looking at the effects of one um, intervention on another, that is experimental using experiments like randomized controlled trials. It makes estimates of probab probability of effects and confidence intervals. Uh, and most importantly, it's based on a very narrow range of patients. Only about 5% of uh, the public actually engages in clinical studies, and those are further selected to do this type of research that go into uh, the summaries that the Cochrane Collaboration provides. This approach uh, picks at the top of the hierarchy the most important component. And as we can see, that's especially useful for those in policy areas who are trying to make uh, decisions about payment. It's less useful for those who are looking at the science uh, because only good science can give you good information. It does not pay attention to laboratory research and it does not take into consideration observational or probabilistic studies of the general population outside clinical trials, uh, which are more like patients like Sally uh, that you'll see in practice. And finally, uh, anecdotes, qualitative research, and case reports the type of evidence very often preferred by patients are considered less important. In order to make this type of information and this strategy more useful, there's been an adoption of another approach called the grade analysis. And here's an example of how that's applied in acupuncture. Grade analysis takes this type of top of the hierarchy uh, evidence and it begins to ask additional questions. Here's a table that shows acupuncture's uh, grade analysis for a variety of clinical conditions. 
It evaluates the total number of reviews, the total number of studies, and the number of patients or subjects enrolled in those studies. It provides a confidence assessment and a safety grade. And then out of that, it comes out with a recommendation for providers in terms of how strong or weak the evidence is and how ready it is for application in practice. Here's another strategy uh, that I developed years ago called the evidence house model. And what it does is it takes the type of evidence that I've shown you and it divides them into two areas. Those that look at efficacy, that is the specific attributional effects uh, of research, and those that look at effectiveness, or that is the use of evidence in the real world in those areas. The goal of this is to, uh, for any intervention, to look at both efficacy and effectiveness evaluation and make decisions based on the balance of that evidence and its application to your particular patient and their particular values, as I illustrate on the bottom. Here's another approach called the circular evidence model. And this one is probably the most comprehensive and thorough but it's also the most complicated. This approach starts with uh, the questions which are placed in the center of the circle. These questions include things like, what is the therapy and how is it applied? And what is the current state of the evidence? What impact is it having in a particular setting? And can that be generalized to other settings? How does it work? And is it safe? And then, how can that be translated into actual practice? These questions are answered using different types of research approaches as are illustrated on the outside circle. Systematic reviews, program evaluations, mechanisms and validity studies, comparative effectiveness research, and application and implement implementation research are examples of that. It then fills in the variety of methods illustrated here in the center uh, uh, circle uh, that get at that information, that answer those questions uh, in a thorough way. This then most comprehensively matches up the questions with the methods to make a decision about what's valid, rigorous, and relevant. Whenever we evaluate the evidence and whichever of these strategies you uh, use, uh, you still have to know how to critically analyze the evidence for how valid it actually is. And this applies whether you're looking at randomized controlled trials, observational studies, or even qualitative research. This requires a skill that I hope you're learning in uh, medical or nursing school, or you've learned if you're uh, graduated, called critical appraisal. What this is, is evaluating the validity of the evidence uh, in various clinical situations. Let me show you the major types of validity um, that are important for clinical decision making. They include internal validity that evaluates efficacy, external validity that evaluates effectiveness, model validity that looks at relevance, and reporting quality that assesses accuracy. Let me show you some of the tools that are used for evaluating this different, these different types of validity. First, internal validity. This gets at the question of how likely is it that the observed effects are due to the hypothesized treatment. And it uses different uh, analysis approaches, evaluating things like randomization, baseline comparability, changes of intervention during the study, appropriate blinding, the validity of the outcome measures, and appropriate statistical analysis. The second type of validity is external validity. This is asking how likely is it that the observed effects would occur outside the study settings and in different settings. This uses tools evaluating generalizability, reproducibility, clinical significance, therapeutic change or interference that go on during the treatment, and the relevance of the outcome measures. The third type of validity is called model validity, 
This looks at the question of how likely is it that the study accurately reflects the system under investigation. And it evaluates uh, the validity through criteria such as representativeness of the treatment in the study, the use of informed consent and its impact, methodological matching of the questions and the goals of the therapy uh, to the methods, model congruity, and the cultural context in which the therapy is being delivered. I'll illustrate that in more detail uh, later on in the talk. The final type of validity is reporting validity, and this asks how accurately does the article reflect and report on the actual data and findings. You'd be surprised uh, how often the summary in the abstract uh, or even the conclusions in the article actually don't reflect what the data showed. Uh, to evaluate this, you have to make sure that it was evaluated comprehensively, that it is presented clearly, and that the conclusions actually match the data. Once you know how to evaluate the evidence and critically analyze it, then the question comes up, where do you get good evidence? Here are sources uh, in which the two different kinds of evidence in the evidence house that I illustrated before uh, uh, exist in reliable uh, sources. In efficacy, the Cochrane collaboration that I've already pointed to uh, is an excellent source. There is a, uh, a subsection of the Cochrane collaboration that specifically evaluates complementary and alternative medicine and integrative health. G BMJ clinical evidence summaries and ups updates are also an excellent source, as is the National Institutes of Health National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. If you uh, take care of cancer patients, the National Cancer Institute and its sub-office on complementary medicine uh, and a uh, private website called CAM Cancer are also great sources for evidence in the area of efficacy. In the area of effectiveness and safety, there's other organizations uh, in the U.S that evaluate this information and are reliable sources. They include the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, um, uh, the Natural Medicines Database, previously called the National Standard, which is a private source, uh, more about that later, and then an important new source of information on what not to do in the area of medicine called Choosing Wisely, in, in which the evidence on what we should stop doing uh, and what we should deprescribe um, uh, can be applied. I've taken um, uh, the areas of complementary and integrative health and provided succinct um, summaries in these areas that I call provider pocket guides. It draws from these different types of evidence, uh, efficacy and effectiveness, as well as looks at observational studies and then other practical information that you need for making decisions about a practice. Here's a list of some of the ones that we have available and we're producing more and more all along. You can find these on my website, Dr. Wayne Jonas, at resources and can download them free. Let me illustrate uh, how you then take this information, find good evidence, and make a decision for a patient like Sally who's in pain. The current guidelines show that uh, the following kinds of approaches in complementary and integrative health uh, can be useful in the treatment of chronic pain. They include acupuncture, manipulation, cognitive behavioral therapy and stress management, mind-body approaches, and other mind movement approaches such as yoga and Tai Chi. Let me uh, just show you uh, a couple of those areas uh, that will come into making a decision about Sally and her most appropriate treatment. Acupuncture is now used by over three and a half million adults in the United States, a 50% increase in the last five years. It's used also at major medical and academic organizations such as Johns Hopkins, Duke, the Cleveland Clinic, and in the U.S. military and the VA. The WHO endorses it for more than two dozen programs, and its most effective treatment appears to be in the use of chronic pain, where it has been demonstrated repeatedly to be effective even more than placebo acupuncture, as published in journals such as Journal of the American Medical Association and other organizations. 
Sessions typically cost between $65 and $125 per treatment, though that varies to pay based on the country. Uh, some of this now may be covered by health insurance. For example, uh, CMS uh, just approved Medicare to pay for acupuncture uh, for patients like Sally with chronic back pain. Massage therapy is another commonly used approach for chronic pain. In addition, it provides stress and relief and mental relaxation. Uh, the vast majority of patients who receive massage in the country use it for things like pain, stress relief, stiffness, spasm, injury recovery, uh, pregnancy, and sometimes just for general well-being. The evidence currently shows that massage can be effective for conditions such as fibromyalgia pain, anxiety, HIV anxiety, uh, breast cancer symptoms uh, and emotions, and cancer pain, anxiety, and fatigue. The final one I'll illustrate is from yoga because this is one that, as you'll see, turned out to be very important for Sally. Yoga is one of the most sought after used forms in complementary medicine. Uh, people use it for many things, but especially for back pain. Uh, and reports uh, and research has shown that after six months of practicing yoga, those with the back pain have significantly less disability and pain and depression from those using just conventional care. Other studies show that yoga can be effective for a number of other things, including arthritis and carpal tunnel, neck pain, uh, and some mental conditions. Also, uh, certain yoga breathing techniques can help with lung function, uh, such as in COPD and asthma. Sally was also using supplements. And when I asked that question in the integrative health visit, uh, this, these were the ones that I came up with that she told me about. Chondroitin, curcumin, St. John's wort, fish oil, and a multivitamin. It's important that you ask patients about their supplement use, and unfortunately that's not done very often, but it is part of an integrative health visit. Um, patients like Sally with chronic conditions and pain uh, will use supplements very frequently, 60 to 70 percent, and even in the general population, uh, 40 percent regularly use some type of supplement. So it's important that you know how to handle supplements and how to bring in good evidence into their decision making. Some of the questions that you should ask yourself in approaching supplements are these. First of all, is the supplement safe? Uh, and I'll show you why. That's a key question. How will the supplement interact with my patient's medications? Is it containing high quality ingredients? Uh, and there's ways to find that out, uh, but the government currently does not regulate that process. How does it work? Basic science research is important. How will it likely affect the health conditions? What's the cost since many supplements are not covered by health insurance? And is a prescription formulation or a medication better than a supplement for the money and for the clinical outcomes. I've provided a full provider supplement guideline on my website that you can get here, but just let me show you a little bit of the information that is on that. Here uh, is an approach that uh, builds on the greater strategy that I showed you uh, before, but then provides the information in a more useful format for making decisions with patients. This is specifically around supplements and pain, the particular issue I wanted uh, to discuss with Sally in those areas. It's called a bubble map, and it takes the grade recommendations and it graphs them uh, together uh, in bubbles uh, based on the strength uh, and the effect of the information. Uh, the more patients there are on the vertical axis, the higher up it is. The wider the bubble, the more confidence there is that that information is valid. Uh, and the farther it is over to the right, uh, the greater the effect size. You can immediately see from this bubble map that a number of the supplements that Sally was taking have some evidence and several of them did not. Uh, good bubble maps actually will then color code uh, green, yellow, and red uh, based on the grade recommendations in those areas. This uh, approach is helpful for sitting down with patients and making decisions with them. It's important to know some of the basic science, the basic evidence, especially around supplements, because that uh, can make a difference in how they interact with medications that you're on. 
uh, many supplements, including one Sally was on, uh, St. John's wort, um, alter the metabolism of drugs through an enzyme uh, in the P450 system. Here's a, a partial list of some of the drugs that can be uh, altered by St. John's wort and should not be combined with them. Again, uh, full information is on my website uh, download. It's also important to know some of the mechanisms to know how to use the supplements. For example, uh, Sally was on something called glucosamine for her arthritis and her pain, but does it work better than a standard drug like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen? Here's a study showing that uh, comparing ibuprofen directly with glucosamine. Now, glucosamine is not an anti-inflammatory, but ibuprofen is. And you can see from this study uh, that when patients were randomized to glucosamine or ibuprofen, those on the ibuprofen got a very rapid relief so that within two weeks, the ibuprofen worked much better than the glucosamine. That pain relief leveled out for the rest of the time, up to eight weeks. Uh, and then the glucosamine effect which uh, is thought to uh, enhance some of the cartilage healing uh, within the joints, uh, began to accumulate. So that by the eighth week, we saw that the pain relief from glucosamine was actually larger than the ibuprofen. Uh, we understand this because of the mechanisms of how glucosamine and ibuprofen work, which is a basic science type of information. Basic science also can help us uh, uh, make sure that our patients are not taking supplements that are dangerous. Here's a study uh, analyzing the heavy metal that is contained in common supplements uh, that you can buy uh, in the United States. And this shows that uh, lead, mercury, and arsenic are not uncommonly there. In fact, up to 20% of supplements contained uh, dangerous levels of lead. Um, this uh, requires a detailed uh, analysis of the content and making sure that the supplement is properly uh, regulated and of good quality. How do you do that? Well, fortunately, there are some groups that are providing that kind of analysis, uh, since the FDA currently uh, is not to have authority to do that. Uh, these include the National Science Foundation, International USP, and the Consumer Laboratory SEALs. These labs do independent analyses of supplements and will certify certain types of supplements and supplement companies. You can check on the U.S. Pharmacopeia information about dietary supplements and food at the following website, uh, and you can see a dietary and herbal supplement list at the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health uh, and the Office of Dietary Supplements also at the NIH. I recommend that if you do this a lot or your system wants to make sure that supplements are properly managed, that you get a subscription to the National Medicines Comprehensive Database. This is a good evidence-based summary that looks both at the latest information on supplements and their interactions with medications. Checking for drug interactions is important, and again, my guide shows you how to do that, but here's some examples. Supplements can interact with blood thinners, uh, steroid medications, heart medications, chemotherapy, oral contraceptives, and more. Uh, the best uh, source of evidence, in my opinion, around interactions are the, is the Natural Medicines Comprehensive Database that I've previously mentioned, uh, but many health systems um, uh, are providing uh, information about this, such as Memorial Sloan Kettering for cancer uh, and uh, the Academic Consortium for Complementary and Integrative Health. Check those out. Finally, when you make decisions about evidence in practice, well, you have to understand how that information is going to be used. What is the context? What is the belief and expectation of the patient and the provider? And what's the social uh, context and meaning that that treatment has for the patient? This all comes from understanding what is sometimes called the placebo effect. I prefer to use a term that Dan Mormon and I from the University of Michigan developed uh, called the meaning effect or the meaning and context effect. I define that as the physiological, psychological, and clinical effects of meaning and context in treatment. 
Sometimes a placebo, an inert substance, is used to help understand those, but it's not the inert substance that's producing it. It's the ritual, the belief, the meaning, and the context. Here's an example of uh, 117 randomized placebo control trials uh, uh, looking at ulcer treatments. These are the placebo arms of those trials, and as you can see, the healing rates vary anywhere from zero healing all the way up to 100% healing using inert substances based on the meaning and the context and the delivery. The point of this is that even with good evidence, um, it's important to know how to apply it to optimize the meaning and context effects. Belief and expectation are an important part of that. Uh, here's a study showing that pain relief is consistently better for acupuncture uh, if the patient actually believes it's going to work during the therapy and prior to the therapy. Thus, if I were to recommend that to Sally, I would need to check out her beliefs and also have uh, a check on my beliefs uh, on whether I felt it worked or not. The cultural context also makes a difference. Here's a recent study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, in which they tested true acupuncture, placebo or sham acupuncture, and usual care for dry eye post-radiation. Uh, and dry mouth uh, post-radiation. Um, it was done in two different sites, one in China and one in the United States. When you analyzed all the data together, the true acupuncture worked better than the sham acupuncture, which worked better than usual care. But when you looked at the data in China and the US, the differences were quite stark. In the United States, both sham acupuncture and true acupuncture work better than conventional care, uh, but in China, they weren't so fooled by the sham acupuncture, and it was only true acupuncture that actually worked, the other two being uh, equally uh, effective. Thus, the cultural context of the therapy is very important. What I often do with complex patients like Sally with chronic conditions is uh, produce an evidence balance sheet of treatment for the multiple approaches uh, that I showed you before and that might be options. Uh, I ask, uh, what is the evidence uh, that any particular treatment is better than placebo? What is the evidence that it's better than no treatment? Sometimes it's better not to intervene. And what is it compared to other established or inestablished? Is it better uh, than a proven treatment in those areas? Uh, here's what a chart might look like, a balance sheet chart might look like with different kinds of uh, treatments down one side and the questions I just mentioned on the other side and then rating them based on some of the evaluation approaches that I, you've just seen uh, to determine that. All this may seem a bit complex, uh, and it is, <laughs> but fundamentally it comes down to what I call applying the five P's for evidence-based integrative medicine practice. The first P is to protect your patients. Make sure that what they're using is not going to harm them, and I illustrated some ways in which supplements might do that, but it can also harm them through their pocketbook uh, uh, or by substituting for an effective therapy if it's not. The second P is permit things that might facilitate healing but aren't going to be harmful or expensive. We know the meaning and context or the placebo effect can be very uh, uh, useful uh, and make sure uh, not you don't have to use placebos, uh, but use the meaning, the ritual, the belief, the expectation to optimize the treatment uh, if it's not harmful. The third P is to promote what's proven. You've seen lots of therapies and uh, lots of options, but evaluate what we know. Go to the Cochrane Collaboration, go to the other effectiveness and uh, efficacy sites that I showed you about. Uh, and those that are proven should be made available. We want good science-based information available from all different sources, uh, so promote it. Next, payment is key. 
And this is especially true in countries that don't provide healthcare information or don't provide complementary and integrative health that has been proven. Uh, payment is key to access. And so ask your patients about whether they can afford it and uh, help them uh, get access to it and payment. And then the final P and the most important one is partner with the patient. You can help bring in the evidence as I've just discussed in these areas, but ultimately it has to be you and the patient that sit down and look at what's relevant to them, what really matters. That's called person-centered care. I do this with something called the Hope Note, which is a set of tools that I use for integrative health, which ask questions about meaning and purpose, about the social and emotional environment, about behavior and lifestyle, and about the external environment, and then makes decisions about evidence-based practice within that context. Again, uh, in a subsequent lecture on integrative health, I show how and why that's important. Here's how it applied to Sally. So here's how it all comes together. So when I asked Sally what mattered to her, she needed some help in medication management. She was on a number of those. So I worked with our pharmacologist to do that. She did a lot of heat and stretching, which was very yoga-like, but she didn't think yoga worked for her because she'd gone to a class, tried it out, and gotten injured. She hadn't used evidence-based yoga therapies for back pain. She had major issues with sleep problems and stress problems that were perpetuating her chronic pain. So even though she was looking for a treatment, we needed to address those other kinds of self-care components. She needed a place and a time to heal, and it needed to be done in a way that she saw as meaningful for her, that would help bring uh, purpose and meaning back into her life. Once we did that and we got all our team lined up this is what it looked like. I was the coordinator of the team and helping to manage her medical conditions. Our pharmacologist helped with the medication management and our behaviorist helped with the behavior change. We had to go out and find a certified yoga therapist uh, that was using evidence-based approaches uh, uh, to deliver that uh, with Sally. And then her family and her uh, own mind about her body had to be lined up uh, so her expectations and the meaning of the therapy were uh, delivered appropriately. When she did that, she got significant relief from yoga. And as she gradually began to bring in evidence-based yoga into her life, her pain decreased and she voluntarily began to go off her medications and look for a job uh, to restore her purpose. In summary then, um, this quote by Jules Poncaer, I think, illustrates what I've tried to impart to you. Science is built up with facts as a house is with stones, but a collection of facts is no more science than a heap of stones is a house. I hope I've given you some basic tools for being able to build your house of evidence to apply it appropriately in the area of complementary and integrative health. For those of you who want to get more information, uh, I've co-authored with colleagues a book on this uh, called Clinical Research in Complementary Therapies. And you can also get all of this information and more uh, on my website at drwaynejonas.com. I'm funded uh, by an independent nonprofit organization that simply wants to make evidence-based integrative me medicine available to all providers and patients. So, there's no excuse uh, for doing good science and starting right now. Thank you very much.